Hello and welcome to this presentation of Diplomacy Drama. This program is brought to you by the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum's Education Department. My name is Ivy and I will be working with you today. We do recommend having a pencil and paper on hand to take notes with. However, you can also do the activities in your head. The choice is completely up to you. With that established, let us go ahead and get started into the nitty gritty of it all. First, we have a letter from President George H.W. Bush. At the very top of our document, it says Top Secret, and that it's from the White House in Washington. So I'm going to go ahead and read it aloud for all of us. You can follow along with your finger or with your eyes or just your ears. So National Security Review. Memorandum for My Fellow Americans. Subject, the success of the United States is dependent upon you, the people. My Fellow Americans, the people of the United States rely on their president to serve as their chief diplomat around the world. I worked hard to build relationships with leaders from all over the world in order to protect citizens of the United States. Two of my greatest diplomatic accomplishments were the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Persian Gulf War. I was going to send information on each event to some of our elected leaders, but the labels on the boxes fell off. Can you help me organize this information between my diplomatic accomplishments so our current leaders can follow the example that has been set for them? Diplomacy is hard, but I know you are up for the challenge. Thank you for your service to our country. Good luck. The future of our nation is in your hands. Sincerely, George Bush. Okay, so it looks like we have our mission. Looks like our problem is that the labels on the boxes fell off. And the events we're talking about are the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Persian Gulf War. And that we need to relabel these boxes and probably sort out some information that goes along with them. Okay, so that's our mission and let's go ahead and get started. But before we do that, it's probably good if we have some background information on it all. So let's review some information about the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Persian Gulf War. To begin, let us talk real quick about two systems of government that will come up. First is democracy, which is the principle that underpins our republic. In our system of government, people have the right to private property, economic decisions, such as what businesses to start, what to sell, and at what price to sell at, rests largely with the people. Moreover, the people elect representatives who debate and vote on the laws. There is more than one party at play. Contrasting that, there is communism. In communism, the state owns all the property. For example, in some countries, rather than being able to outright own a home, you can have a rental lease that lasts 70 years, at which time the property reverts back to the state. In that sense, all property is public because it cannot be privately owned or passed down. Additionally, the state makes economic decisions. The state has heavy influence on the country's industrial decisions, determining what gets made and oftentimes partially owning the big businesses of the country. In the extremes, the state also determines where people will live and what work they will do. The state is ruled by one party or one person and the general populace has very little say about the laws and decisions made by the state. Okay, 
So with those two government practices and philosophies established, let us roll into discussing the fall of the Berlin Wall. I am going to go ahead and read this page out loud. You can follow along in whatever way suits you best. So fall of the Berlin Wall. Background. After World War II ended, Germany and its capital, Berlin, were divided into four zones. On May 8, 1949, the French, United Kingdom, and U.S. zones were combined into West Germany under a democratic republic government. East Germany was controlled by the Soviet Union under a communist government. Berlin was also divided between West Berlin, Democratic Republic, and East Berlin, Communist rule. From 1949 through 1961, more than 2.5 million East Germans escaped to West Germany, with many of them escaping by crossing the checkpoints between East and West Berlin. The numbers fleeing to the West became so bad that overnight, East German soldiers laid down 30 miles of barbed wire. This closed off East Berlin from West Berlin. When families awoke the next morning in West Berlin, many realized they were now cut off from the other members of their family who lived across the street in East Berlin. Eventually, the East German Communist government built a 15-foot-high concrete wall topped with barbed wire and guard towers. East Germany and the Soviet Union said the wall was to protect the people of East Germany, but everyone knew it was to keep the East Germans from leaving. And here we have a map of occupied Germany, just like we were talking about on the previous slide. On the left side of the screen is a map of the country as a whole, and on the right side of the screen is a close-up of the city of Berlin. Uh, looking at the country, it is, cur it is divided into four occupied zones. In the upper left corner is the United Kingdom's area. The bottom left corner is the French area, the bottom right corner is the American area, and the upper right area was controlled by the USSR. Now if we look at this USSR area a little more closely, we can see the city of Berlin, which we'll look at on the kind of the blown up area. So this city was also subdivided between these four occupiers. You had West Berlin, which was made up of the French, United Kingdom, and American occupations. And then you had East Berlin, which was controlled by the USSR, just like we talked about. And then the Berlin Wall actually ran a, went around this whole area of West Berlin. During the height of the tensions, supplies were airlifted into West Berlin. Otherwise, that portion of the city would have struggled to provide for itself, surrounded as it was by Soviet occupation. It got to the point where a plane landed or took off in West Berlin every 30 seconds. This is still in living memory for some people. Okay, with that knowledge in mind, it is time for the next slide. This one is the Persian Gulf War. Like last time, we'll read it together. Background. On August 2nd, 1990, the Iraqi army led by Saddam Hussein invaded and occupied Kuwait. This invasion was condemned by many nations and the United Nations Security Council. 
President George H.W. Bush immediately condemned the invasion, as did the governments of Great Britain and the Soviet Union. The UN Security Council authorized the use of all necessary means of force against Iraq if they did not withdraw from Kuwait. After Hussein refused to withdraw from Iraq, a coalition, countries that worked together, of 35 nations led by the U.S. worked to defeat Iraq and drive them out of Kuwait. President George H.W. Bush met with Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, Great Britain, and the leaders of many other countries, especially the leaders of Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, to keep them informed of the progress in liberating or freeing Kuwait. <coughs> And here we have a map of the region. Starting on the upper left and going down towards the right in a diagonal, we have the country of Iraq, then there's Kuwait, and then the Persian Gulf. Iraq is at least 10 times larger than Kuwait, for sure. Uh, lastly, the Persian Gulf was an extremely important part of the supply chain when coalition forces engaged Iraqi forces during Operation Desert Storm. U.S. naval forces based themselves there and worked with the U.S. Army and other land forces. Okay, with that information in our pocket, let us now work on the sorting. So here is our box in the middle of the screen and our two label options above it. The labels say Berlin Wall and Persian Gulf War. Okay, time to open up our box and see what is inside. If you'd like, on a piece of paper, you can keep track of key words, phrases, or image details that pop out at you during the investigation process. I will also keep track of some keywords on the right hand side of the screen as we go along. So our first document is a map with labeled countries and arrows with extremely limited details about geographic features. I am going to give us a few moments to look it over before we start teasing out some key details and identifiers. Just take note of anything that really stands out to you. Okay, and welcome back. So I am going to start noting down some of the things I noticed on the right hand side of the screen. We may have some of the same things and we may have some different things. That is simply the fun of multiple people investigating the same thing. All right, so the first thing that jumps out to me are the country titles, such as Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and also a geographic title of the Persian Gulf. So I know we are looking at a map of the Middle East. Next is the title on the key right here. Operation Desert Storm. So we know we are looking at some sort of military movement or operation, which in turn explains the other thing that stands out, which is the arrows. Lots of arrows. So many of these arrows start in Saudi Arabia. They go up through Iraq and then hook right towards Kuwait. So I'm going to go ahead and put that down. The arrow troop 
movements. Each of these arrows, in turn, are labeled with an image, which I will go ahead and make an educated, educated guess about and say that each image represents a particular contributor from the coalition. So, based on all of this, our keywords, what we're seeing, we can make a guess that this box should be labeled the Persian Gulf War. All right. So that's a start. Let us go on to the next one. Okay, so here's our box and we open it. And this time we have a black and white photo of a city with multi-story buildings being bisected by an area, uh, area of emptiness. Same as before, Let's take a moment to observe some details. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to note down is that this photo is in black and white. So while it's not a guarantee, we can still make an inference that this is an older photograph. I also see some dense tree growth. So it's probably not in the Middle East. So lastly, there is this barren line of concrete that is going through the city in a curved diagonal. I won't lie, <laughs> my first thought was that this was possibly a train track. However, with a bit more study and the knowledge that we are sorting for the Berlin Wall and the Persian Gulf War, we are likely looking at a historical photo of the wall from sort of some sort of aerial perspective. In fact, just take a look at the street lamps and how the ones on the left-hand side are kind of curved and facing outwards. And then the lamps on the right-hand side are straight up and down. So between the two sides, there is a bit of different infrastructure. The architecture of the buildings themselves are also diverging with a more box-like style developing on the right side. Mind you, I do not know the dates of when the buildings we see were constructed, but it is a potential pattern to explore should any of the future historians, architects, engineers, or artists in the room like to do more research on the subject. Okay, so let us go ahead and put down concrete wall. Okay, well with that established, let us go ahead and label this box with Berlin Wall. Okay, good job us. Next one. Okay, so here we have another black and white photo. In this one, there are nine children playing with no grass or greenery in sight. So last time I gave us a moment to collect our thoughts and I'll do that again. Okay, so let's let's just start with the basic details I mentioned. So we have a black and white photo. It is a photo of children and they appear to be playing. There's nine of them. So another thing that pops out to me is that all the children are wearing jackets. So we are looking at somewhere that's currently cold 
possibly in the winter or fall time. And the children have appeared to have found some bricks that they have stacked into a wall. And we can assume it was them because there's no mortar in between any of the bricks. So they're just dry stacking them. So we have a brick wall, presumably for play. Okay. And this is further supported because we also see these four children right here. One, two, three, four, uh, pointing toy guns at each other. So what we have here is a scene of children playing, but with some kind of dark overtones, really. So the thing about play is that they will often imitate and play out what they see and hear around them, things that they can see adults doing even. So based on that, which event are they playing out? The Persian Gulf War or the Berlin Wall? Okay, so I'm going to go with the Berlin Wall. And I'm going to guess that you probably did too. So let's go ahead and label our box with the Berlin Wall. And done. All right. Let's take a moment. Deep breath in. Deep breath out. Roll your shoulders forward only as much as is comfortable. Roll your shoulders back. Again, only as much as is comfortable. All right, we are ready for the next one. Okay, so this time we have a document. So I'm just gonna go ahead and read it aloud so we can just do it together. So dear John, Thank you for your letter of August 6, enclosing the memorandum prepared by your committee's staff on the energy situation resulting from Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. I share your concern about minimizing the impact of the oil supply disruption on the U.S. and world economies. Increased production from oil producers, a drawdown of the large company stocks, and conservation and fuel switching will all contribute to alleviating the shortage caused by the loss of Iraqi and Kuwaiti oil. We are working diligently in each of these areas. In addition, we are examining in conjunction with our allies in the International Energy Agency, whether a drawdown of government-owned or controlled stocks is desirable at this time. I have also asked Secretary Brady to analyze the economic impact of the district of the disruption of oil supplies so that we can have the best analysis possible as we review the various energy options before us. Sincerely. Oh, and there's a crossed out line and we'll follow the arrow. So this goes before the sincerely. Thank you for your support and best, best wishes. Okay, so that's a bit of an edited letter right there. So let's look and take a moment and see what keywords jump out at us. So I'll give you guys that, that moment. Okay, so I'm going to say the thing that really jumped out at me besides, you know, the, uh, the edits in blue is Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. So we'll write that down, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. So with just that alone, we can probably figure out between the Berlin Wall and the Persian Gulf War, which one this applies to. 
But let's go ahead and just look at some more of the details simply because it's interesting. So in a lot of this, we are talking about energy. We have the international energy agency playing a role. Oil also is playing a role and it is affecting economies. So that also can tell us just some really interesting things about what happened in terms of the events and the milieu surrounding the Persian Gulf War. Okay, was there anything else that jumps out at us? Oh, we're working with allies. Well, we mentioned the international agency, but we know from previous reading that there's a large coalition. So we're definitely looking at an event that affected more than just the United States. And it was pretty widespread. We're talking about like oil producers. We're talking about economies, world economies, international um, agents, all sorts of things. So, okay, that's pretty cool. But I think we're ready to go ahead and label this box. So here's our box. And here is our label of Persian Gulf War. Okay, let's see what the next one holds for us. Okay, so you know the drill. Here is our box. Here is our document. This time we have a color photo with two gentlemen on it and two flags in the background. I'll give you guys a moment to study some of the details. Okay, so let's break this down together. So let's see. We have a color photo. And we have two flags. One is clearly the U.S. flag. And the other one, we can tell from the sickle right here, sickle and hammer, this one is going to be the U.S. S R flag. Okay. And so we have our two gentlemen here shaking hands. For those who don't recognize him, I'm just going to go ahead and say it outright that this is President George H.W. Bush. So we have one world leader on the left side, and we have one on the other side as well, actually. You may or may not be familiar with him, but this is actually President Gorbachev of the Soviet Union. So we have two world leaders they're shaking whoopsies shaking hands okay so take a moment to think about this in between between our events which is the persian gulf war and the fall of the berlin wall where did the ussr feature the most prominently between those two Cool. If you're saying the fall of the Berlin Wall, you are correct, because if we think back to our earlier map, the USSR was heavily involved in, well, they made the wall, so yeah, they were very heavily involved, so around the city of Berlin. So now we're going from this, where you're seeing occupation forces, lots of division, to two world leaders shaking hands. So the Berlin Wall did fall during President Bush's presidency. And to give you an example of why this is so important, I'm actually going to refer back to a conversation that was recorded between these two gentlemen. Bear with me one second. Okay, so the Berlin Wall fell on November 9th 1989. This part of the conversation is a transcript from December the 2nd, 1989, between the president, um, well, president of the United States, President Bush, and uh, Chairman Gorbachev of the USSR. 
So I'll go ahead and read it for us. The president, I hope you have noticed that as dynamic change has accelerated in recent months, we have not responded with flamboyance or arrogance that would complicate USSR relations. What I am saying may be self-serving. I have been called cautious or timid. I am cautious, but not timid. But I have conducted myself in ways not to complicate your life. That's why I have not jumped up and down on the Berlin Wall. Chairman Gorbachev. Yes, we have seen that and appreciate that. We have some concern on one thing, your actions in the Philippines. I appreciate your letter and want to discuss this. Okay, so that conversation is extremely important because after the fall of the Berlin Wall, you had reunification. So at this point, you have had two parts of Germany, East Germany, West Germany, that have been separated for decades. Different currencies, different architecture, different jobs, different industry levels, different standards of living. Even the language had grown somewhat separate. So you're now taking these two halves that one was functioning under democratic occupiers and the other was functioning under communist occupiers, and you're trying to reunite them. The whole world was involved in this, including the United States. What this conversation's alluding to is the fact that President Bush played it cool. He did not want to embarrass the USSR with the fall of the wall because the USSR still had to come to the table for reunification efforts to actually work. Chancellor Helmut Kohl of Germany later gave President Bush a piece of the fallen Berlin Wall that is actually on display at the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library Museum. Uh, He gave it to him as a token, a symbol of the large role President Bush played in the reunification efforts behind the scenes. So that's also really cool. Okay, well, with all that said, let us go ahead and label our box. So box and Berlin Wall. Okay, so... That is our last box of this program, but before I wrap it up and move us on to the next set of activities, I'll just let you know we do have some really cool primary source documents available on our website. You just go to the research tab and it will take you right to the research website. For example, some of these include uh, selected documents from the archives, including the aviator flight log from when President Bush was a pilot in the Navy during World War II. So just all that stuff is available to look through, as well as more telecons and memcons of conversation President Bush had with uh, Chairman Gorbachev, as well as President Um, Helmut Kohl of Germany about the reunification process. There's documents about the Persian Gulf War as well, as well as many other things that happened during his presidency, up to and including the Americans with Disabilities Act. So that's just an incredible resource that is available to you as well. Okay, so we're getting close to the end. But to wrap up today, we are going to be taking a page from our Passport for Learning um, activity book, and we're going to be doing one of the activities, specifically the pillars to live by. So each of these pillars were inspired by President George H.W. Bush's lifetime of service. The first pillar is lifetime of service, you know, perfect The next one is putting people first in decision-making. And the last one is building relationships to better the world. 
Okay, so here's how this is going to work. You're going to have a piece of paper in front of you, or you're going to keep track in your head, but we're going to come up with at least one example for each of these pillars. Now, these examples can be from President George H.W. Bush's life, or they can be from your own life. Either one works. So let's do the first one. So we have a lifetime of service. So we're going to go look at our pictures here. Really, you can pick and choose from any of the pictures and any of the captions where you think they best apply, but we're going to make our lives a little easy today and go to where it says lifetime of service. And we'll just start with the first one. It says Congressman Bush with President Dwight Eisenhower. All right, so let's let's unpack that a little bit. So President Bush was a congressman. He was also the director of the CIA. He was also U.S. liaison to China and was the vice president of the United States and later became the president of the United States. <laughs> if that is not a long laundry list of service to others, oh, and we can't forget he was also a World War II veteran. So we're talking about serving the public from the time he was 18, just throughout the majority of his professional life, and then he was involved in charities um, even after he was no longer president. So we're just talking about a lifetime of service to choose from. But based on the picture, we're going to make our lives easier for ourselves. If I can click on it. There we go. And we'll just put Bush served the public by serving in public office. A statement inspired by the fact he was a congressman and such. Okay, Whoop. there we go. Uh, so go ahead, take a moment, look at the screen, and kind of decide what do you think is a good example of putting people first in decision making. This can also be an example from your own life. Okay, so that was the second one. Now take a moment to find an example from your own life or an example from this screen right here of building relationships to better the world. Okay, so that wraps that up. A uh, real quick uh, example of number two is that when Bush signed the Americans with Disabilities Act, there were actually, there was backlash. Some people didn't like it, and even in his own party. But he decided to put the needs of the general people above necessarily his political party. And then building relationships to better the world uh, could be considered all of the diplomatic ties that he built up with foreign leaders and dignitaries. Okay, so that sums that up. So thank you so much for joining us today. For more information about any of our programs, you can go to bush41.org. You can also contact us with any questions you may have at bush.education at nara.gov. To recap a little bit, today we went over uh, what was involved in the Berlin Wall, as well as the Persian Gulf War. Then we sorted out different images and texts into the correct category of which event it went with, and then we wrapped up with the pillars to live by. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us today, and I hope you have a lovely rest of your day.